Good day. Now it's time to take a look at the USS Stewart. Now in real time, after we finished with the USS Kavala, we actually took some time to sit in some air conditioning and hydrate. So many people go on these excursions and they're never properly prepared and thus have a terrible time. Remember, proper planning equals proper fun. So now, let's go take a look at that Biade ship. The USS Stewart was named for Charles Stewart, a man who commanded a number of vessels in addition to the legendary USS Constitution, and he also was the first flag officer in American history. He lived a long life and died at the ripe old age of 91 in the year 1869. The USS Stewart itself was built at Brown Shipbuilding in Houston, Texas, and was launched in 1943. The tech specs are as follows. The USS Stewart is an Edsall-class destroyer escort. It displaces 1,253 long tons standard weight and 1,590 long tons when fully loaded. Its length is 306 feet, its beam is 36.58 feet, and its draft is 10.42 feet. It's propelled by... 4FM diesel engine and has two screws. And it has a top speed of 21 knots and has a total range of 9,100 nautical miles at 12 knots. And has a complement of 8 officers and 201 enlisted. And it does not have air conditioning. The only air conditioning you get is if there's a cool sea breeze. And despite being small in surface ship terms, it is rather well armed with 3 3 inch guns, 2 40 millimeter AA guns, 8 20 millimeter AA guns, 3 21 inch torpedo tubes, 8 depth charge projectors, 1 hedgehog depth charge projector, and 2 depth charge tracks. The steward here is one of the last destroyer escorts still in existence, with the only other one being in use by the Mexican Navy, going to show that these ships were pretty bloody tough since one is still being used to this day. The destroyer escort is distinct from the destroyer in that the DE is meant to escort convoys and not destroyers as I first thought. And it has a different combat philosophy. A destroyer is supposed to be able to keep up with the fleet or potentially go faster than it, meaning it needs to go about 25 to 35 knots. The destroyer escort only needs to keep up with a slow moving convoy and provide submarine and aircraft protection. The destroyer escort has a tighter turning radius and a more specialized armament, and as it would turn out, sonar is actually useless at speeds over 20 knots. As you can imagine, I was nerding out even more about this ship since it's far larger than the submarine, although in all reality, they're about the same length. But the Edsall class here is a bit taller, as you can see. And remember, this is a small one, so that's kind of hilarious when you think about it. This is small for a surface ship, whereas that submarine is big for a submarine. That's just crazy. Really, this is pretty much a sardine can when compared to an Iowa or something along those lines. Still though, it's quite cool to be in close proximity to a ship like that, as it's just so awesome to say the least. And here is the intro to the actual ship itself, where there's some screws laid down and some big ass cannons. Really, what would be really cool is to actually get these things in the functional shape and actually blow some shit up with them. But, alas, they're just on display. Really, it's quite amazing just how much work has been put into this ship to keep it looking as good as it does. So now, we're going to attempt to ascend the stairs and enter the ship proper. I am watching out. No, you're not. Okay, how was I supposed to know? She got lucky that that bloody stair step moved forward slightly. Had it not, I would have just kept walking up. It's not like I was paying more attention to filming than I was where I was going. I, seriously, that would just be ridiculous. Although really, I, I was leaning quite far forward to actually get a shot of my feet so it looked really cool. But still, that was one of those little incidental funny moments that just was absolutely perfect. And then, of course, we have the USS Kavala, which was seen in the previous video, looking all awesome. And as you can see, it's not that much smaller than the steward here. One thing I will mention is the paint on the steward is a lot better than on the Kavala there. They've really worked to keep the paint on this thing looking absolutely pristine. Now, I know what you're thinking as we get closer to the prow of the ship here. There's one song that will pop into your mind, and it popped into my mind too, right when I stood up there. I'm the king of the world on a boat like Leo. 
Yeah, I know, I know. It, that, that I'm on a boat song is so old, but it just felt rather fitting there. Now, as you can see, this is once again a small ship, but my good, great space dragon, does it look good. And, of course, that little green uh, missile-looking things right there, those are the hedgehogs. Those apparently, according to the tech specs on the ship, were actually more useful than just the standard depth charging and actually got a higher kill ratio. That, of course, I believe is a 3-inch gun. That's actually really quite small, especially when compared to, say, like a 16-inch cannon seen on a battleship. One thing that's kind of funny is there are many people who aren't really familiar with naval ships uh, will call just about any ship a battleship. This thing is about as far from a battleship as you can possibly get. This is nothing. A battleship could eat this thing for breakfast and still have room left over for a couple more. Because this is a very, very small ship. And for whatever reason, when I point the camera accidentally directly into the sun, it causes a lot of video artifacting. Not really sure why. But, oh well. That's just something you have to avoid, I suppose. Now, of course, the superstructure of the ship is a lot bigger, as you'd imagine, than the submarine, so we're going to be taking a look at all the different little weapons mounts, and I thought that was an air conditioner, uh, but it is not. Because when you actually go inside the ship, it is not air conditioned in the slightest. It is bloody hot in there. And, of course, what we're walking up to now are the depth charge racks. There would have been little drums that would be put in there, and they would be dropped into the water, in an attempt to destroy a submarine. Really, destroying submarines was not an easy prospect back then. Eventually, they would get to where it was very dangerous to be a submariner, at least if you were a part of the Kriegsmarine. The American submariners actually had improved technologies and things of that nature. Now, towards the end of the war, the U-boats did get the snorkel device, which allowed it to stay submerged uh, a lot longer, but still... The happy time, as it was known, was long over by 1944. Now, once again, I still thought that was an air conditioner, but you walk in there, it's really hot. It's really hot where I am right now, because you're outside directly in the sun. There, of course, is a little PA system there. I'd hate to have to be told that submarine sighted, because that's when it gets really scary, to say the least. This, of course, is another 3-inch gun mount, I believe. Well, I could have just read that sign, but didn't. Now, of course, I have to have my epic climbing sequence there. The guns and everything on this ship are just so well preserved. There's hardly any rust or anything on these things. And I guess that's because they probably have been constantly cleaning these things. Really, keeping a ship of any sort uh, in any sort of working order or just like it is now is not an easy prospect. And there is the sight. Looks really cool. Definitely like to get the thing in working order and blow something up. There, of course, is my mother for scale. Those aren't small mounts, that's for sure. But you gotta also keep in mind that a 16-inch cannon dwarfs that like you wouldn't believe. Really, the best way to keep cool on this bloody thing is uh, the sea breeze coming off the ocean there. It actually does feel pretty cool, but I imagine it's only like 80 degrees versus the over 100 that it was uh, in the sun here. And inside, it's even worse. I actually recall hearing someone talking on the ship, and I have not actually corroborated it with my research, but it does sound legitimate, at least from my experience being on the ship, is that they tried to spend as much time outside as is humanly possible. Because it does get to be about almost like an oven in that bloody ship. Now, of course, we'll be taking a look at the uh, AA guns fairly quickly. But it's amazing just how big this ship actually feels when you're walking around on it. I cannot imagine what it would be like to be uh, on an Iowa. And there, of course, are some 3-inch uh, shells. Those things are absolutely massive. Can you imagine actually firing one of those off? That would be really quite cool, I would think. Now, the AA guns in and of themselves are actually pretty huge, too. One of the things that allowed the Allies to really get one up on the axis was the uh, delayed fuses on there. And of course that says wet and I'm going to walk right, right through it because I don't care. It really wasn't though. I don't know why it was actually labeled that. I guess it was at one time but it all evaporated. But the delayed fuses on their shells really really helped. And I also believe they had uh, radar guided munitions towards the end of the war. One thing that's actually quite cool that uh, isn't really mentioned that is that they actually were able to hook in some machine guns to a radar to actually track enemy planes 
And thanks to radar, the machine guns could actually be pretty accurate. Which, you wouldn't think World War II tech would allow for that, but, well, it did. There's a lot of technology from just World War II that would seem almost science fiction to even today's standards. There's a bit of steel just laying around on the deck. Because keeping a ship up is not an easy prospect. That's why there's not that many museum ships. In many respects, it's a lot more economical just to scrap the bloody thing. Which is sad, indeed, for us who really like history. Really, this ship's condition is just a testament to the park workers' dedication to actually keeping this thing alive. I mean, just look at how good the paint is. Like, I know that's a very minor thing, but keeping a ship like this not rusting is a major amount of difficulty. Look at that. Look at how cool that looks. And remember, this is a small ship, and yet just seeing that whole thing arrayed beneath you just looks so awesome. And of course, there's a big spotlight over there. That thing would have actually been used to communicate over long distances if you didn't want to use the radio. Now, what we're about to look at is a weird little thing. I have no idea what it is, but I can only assume it might be like some kind of semaphore flag thing, some kind of Morse code kind of thing. I have no clue, but it's a little thing with like symbols and letters and things printed on it. Hard to say what it is. So now let's enter the ship and take a look at what lurks within. Now, I did turn it on tungsten, because I thought we were primarily going to be using interior lighting, but all the hatches were thrown as wide as they possibly could be, because, well, the ship has no air conditioning, which means it's very, very hot, which means you want as much breeze coming through as you can humanly get. Now, of course, you look up there, there's a little red alert light whenever the ship goes into combat. What we're about to look at here is the CIC. It's a very small CIC, indeed. That, of course, is the Combat Information Center. Really, you'll notice that despite the fairly large size of the ship, the interior is pretty bloody cramped. Not as cramped as the submarine, but still, it's a lot less spacious than you'd think. Because, once again, you gotta remember, it might look big on the outside, but they gotta fit a lot of crap inside that ship. So that means very narrow stairwells. Which means you gotta be very careful going down there so you don't trip and fall and break your neck, which would be a very, very bad thing. There, of course, is a little bulletin board that has a bit of the local history of the ship. And on that note, let's take a look at the history of the Stuart itself. The USS Stuart began its operational life training destroyer escort crews out of Norfolk. The assignment lasted for a bit, but was broken by two convoy escorting assignments. In 1944, she escorted a convoy to Iceland, and later that year she went to Port Royal and made experimental attacks on the captured sub Rhea. She would later participate in a search off of Bermuda for an unidentified contact, but nothing was found. Overall, she had a perfectly competent career as an escort, but did nothing all that significant other than, well, not being sunk and everyone dying, which was actually a fairly common fate for destroyers, sadly enough. In 1974, she was donated by the U.S. Navy to the city of Galveston, and sadly, as time went on, she suffered from neglect due to both the elements and vandalism, because people are so caring to their various monuments. It was considered that she was to be moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, as it was found out that the hull was in good enough condition to be refloated. But then it gets worse. Had it been moved, at least it would still be in existence. But in 1998, the Galveston Parks Board announced its intention to scrap both the Kavala and the Steward and turn Seawolf Park into a bloody RV park. Gotta love how us Americans treat our monuments to history. If it's not bringing in the dollars, just demolish the bloody thing and build a bloody RV park. Thankfully, there was a protracted battle that eventually was won by individuals with some sense. And the Galveston Parks Board graciously allowed the Kervala Historical Foundation to raise funds for the restoration and further preservation of these fine ships. As of 2006, the Stuart has been undergoing considerable restoration with repainting and repairs aimed at returning the ship to its wartime appearance. Further work is underway to correct a number of inaccuracies as the ship's mast is actually from the Buckley-class USS Holton. Thanks to Hurricane Ike, the Stuart suffered rather extensive flooding and wind damage, and repairs and restoration are still ongoing. 
While the USS Stewart might not have had quite the ride of the USS Kavala, it still served quite competently. And really, while it's cool to talk about, oh yeah, I was in a dozen different battles, you really don't want to actually be in a dozen different battles. Because if you get unlucky, that ship gets blown up and you get to meet Davy Jones and all of his CG glory. Now, of course, here we are in the bathroom, ladies and gentlemen. There, of course, is the general and all his smugness. Now, of course, here we have the shower. How would you like to use that? And, of course, what we're about to take a look at is the bathroom. Yeah, it's a trough. That's just... That's that, that's just gross. I mean, yeah, obviously on a ship like this, you're not going to have much privacy, but, man, defecating into a trough. Mmm, sounds like fun to me. Want to join the Navy? Although, theoretically, it's actually a little bit better now, I would hope. What we're about to take a look at here is the ship's store. This is where you can buy a little bric-a-brac, like cigarettes, soap, things of that nature. I would hope that many people would use soap on this particular ship, because not only do you have to defecate in a trough, but you probably don't want to just stew in everybody's body odor. Now, I know these days we often like to mock people for smoking at any time period, but let's face it, if you're stuck on a ship with 200 people defecating in a trough, you deserve a cigarette. And sure, there's going to be people back on the mainland talking about how, oh, how stupid these people were, but let's face it, if you're on a bloody ship defecating in a trough, you're going to probably want a cigarette, even if you're the most anti-smoking person imaginable. While this ship might be bigger in some respects than that bloody submarine, it's still pretty tight in these confines. And once again, this is a ship filled with 200 odd people. That, ladies and gentlemen, is still pretty bloody crazy to me. Can you imagine sharing this space with all those bloody people and also defecating in a trough? Now, what we're about to see here is me forgetting just how close the confines actually are. Perhaps my mother was correct, and I really wasn't paying as close attention as it was humanly possible. Much to my chagrin. And I would stay, but you know, when I get... Oh! Oh! oh. Are you okay? You know, there is such a thing as dying for your art, and that'll be really hilarious. <laughs> oh! Are you bleeding? No. That really hurt. Well, if you go for your video. Oh, yeah. People will be like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> And you know I will. And that's oh, I will. Yes, that hurt every bit as much as it sounded, and yes, I still have a bit of a bruise. Now just imagine if I was trying to get out of there while somebody was shooting a torpedo at me. Now at Sea Wolf Park, there is a memorial area to many of the ships that were lost in World War II, and it is really sad to see a lot of ship names with lost with all hands, lost with all hands, lost 50 men, lost 75 men, and it really drives home the sacrifice that these men made to ensure that we still were free to do all that we can do today. It's very easy to be smug these days on the internet, but remember, that ability to be smug was bought and paid for in human lives. And we need to respect the veterans for all that they did for us. So now, let's stop being depressing and head out to the beach! The beach was really awesome. There weren't all that many people, and it was actually slightly cooler out there as well. And the sound of the waves crashing against the rocks was quite peaceful indeed. And before leaving Galveston, we went by a local comic shop. The trip back was uneventful, and before we call it a video, we're going to take a look at some of that cool stuff that I picked up from the comic shop. Yes, indeed. The comic shop was quite good, to say the least. They had quite the selection, actually. More so than Bedrock City, it would appear. And, of course, they had a few little collectibles lying around, including this swoop. That was a grand total of 12 bucks. And with a price that low, I had to pick it up. I could imagine picking it up for cheaper off of eBay, but really, this is a NRFB! NRFB! For 12 bucks. So I guess the swoop did not really hold its value. The box itself is in quite good condition all around. And, well, I'm glad to get it because I always wanted this back in the day but never could find it. And I always actually rather liked the swoop from the video game and it looks just about as cool as it did back then. Essentially, a swoop is just a souped up speeder bike that is supposed to be extremely dangerous. Now, technically, ladies and gentlemen, this is an S swoop, not a swoop. So this is supposed to be slightly less dangerous. Now, of course, there is the famous novel, Tatooine Ghost, where Han is actually riding on what is effectively just a jet engine with a saddle on it. I'm not really sure how realistic that is, but it was still cool nonetheless. 
And of course, I eventually want to unbox this, but I'm not going to do so for the time being. And it is really cool to get a special little figure, which is the Swoop Trooper, which is not actually canon, or it's not actually part of the EU. But he does look really quite cool, I have to say. Really, the Imperial Forces did not actually use one of these, although it's called a Swoop Trooper, but if you look on back, he's just supposed to be an Imperial Bounty Hunter. But whatever the case may be, it's still cool nonetheless. Also, I picked up 20 magic cards for a buck. I didn't really expect to get anything that amazing out of this, but it was a buck. So I thought, why not just get it on a lark? And well, most of the cards are more or less useless. Although, Tormented Hero here doesn't look that bad. Essentially, whenever you cast a spell that targets Tormented Hero, each opponent loses one life and you gain life equal to the life loss this way. This one appears to be one of the better ones in here, but then again, I never will admit to being that amazing of a Magic the Gathering player. To me, that looks pretty good. Ultimately, the rest are decent enough, I suppose, but really, you can't expect that much for a buck. So ultimately, let's take it back to the chair and wrap up the video. And so that was the very first outdoor excursion, and I hope you guys highly enjoyed road tripping with General Lots. I personally highly enjoyed the overall experience, and I hope you guys did too. And if you want to see more, just leave a comment. So now, I am General Lots, wishing you a good San Jacinto Monument, and good Galveston Flight Museum, or whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed this outdoor excursion to the USS Stewart, please consider subscribing, and if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can continue to bring you these awesome outdoor excursions to cool ships such as this.